Good afternoon. And we're going to start talking about the blood group systems. So we're going to talk about ABO and H blood group systems and what it means to be a secretor. And, you know, and maybe what you're thinking is it's just a simple like A, B, A, B, or O. Uh, but there's a little more that goes into um, the blood grouping, um, which you know, on a routine be basis isn't going to bother you in blood bank until you get some weird patient um, that has some sort of uh, subtype or uncommon uh, ABO blood group that we can't pick up with our routine reagents. Um, but we'll talk about that later. So when we look at um, this week's lecture, we're going to look at, you know, how we de define a blood group system. Uh, what are we looking at for antigens and their inheritance? Um, we're going to talk about Landsteiner's rule. And then we're going to look at um, what cells um, and secretions that can have the antigens. Um, this comes into play when we're looking at if we need to administer Rogam, if we need to make sure that um, they're ABO compatible products, um, and we'll talk further about that as well. Um, and then we're gonna talk about how the ABO, H, and secretor genes are related. So what I want you to be able to get from this and and one of the things you can do is actually when you start doing um, your outlines as we get further in and the information gets a little more dense, um, you can use the headers in the chapters and you can use the objectives as your guide so you can actually write an answer you know, to these objectives uh, to basically help you study. Um, so moving forward, we want to be able to look at type 1 and type 2 oligosaccharide structures, where they're located, how the H antigen is formed um, with the genes and how it's related to the ABO antigen expression. Um, I always liken it to the Statue of Liberty where you have the pedestal and then you've got the statue and then here is her crown and then her pretty dress, right? So this is the H and this is your ABO. Um, so we need that pedestal. Um, I believe we talked about this already. Um, I could be wrong. I forget who I tell what. So I repeat myself. Um, and then um, how do we select whole blood, red blood cell, and plasma products for transfusion? Because um, believe it or not, we still have techs um, out in the field that need reminders as to what's a compatible unit. Um, so it can be difficult. Um, we're going to talk about the glycosyl transferases and the immunodominant sugars um, for the blood group alleles. And we're going to look at our phenotypes, or A1 and A2 um, antigens, um, or also known as, as subgroups um, as well. And then we're going to look at um, ABO genotypes and ABO phenotypes. Um, I, hopefully you had that quick reminder of what a genotype and what a phenotype is. This is what you genetically inherit. This is what we can see. Um, so we also want to describe the ABO blood group system antibodies. Um, so what class is it clinically significant? Um, and what are the in vitro serologic reactions? So in blood bank, there, there's a lot of things that you look at um, when it comes to reactivity. Uh, we want to know, is it IgM? Is it IgG? IgM is going to be more cold reacting. IgG is going to be reacting at 37. And we have to be really careful in our testing. And we'll talk more about this as we talk about antibody screens. Um, because there's more than just, you know, a blood type and RH type. Um, we need to look at, are there other antibodies that are present to different antigens? We all have a mosaic across our red cells. So right now in this chapter, we're talking about the ABO blood groups. So ABO, H, and secretor genes, okay? So these are considered our ABO antigens, okay? So picture this as if you're in... Um, all right, so say your backyard. Um, I tried this once in a class where everybody lived in a city and this was a huge epic fail. But I'm gonna assume since you're in North Dakota, you got a lot of trees, you got a lot of shrubbery. You might not be able to see it right now because it's covered in snow. It's covered in ice here for me. Um, so picture your backyard. Okay, so my backyard, I live on a place called Hemlock Point. Um, so we're on a point, we're on a pond, um, but we're full of hemlocks. So these weird, honestly crappy looking pine trees. Um, so I have a lot of these, all right? So say I liken my, so my blood type is A negative. So I liken my A um, antigen to the hemlock tree, okay? So my backyard 
has a whole crap ton of hemlocks. But they've got that layer of soil, okay, that top soil where the, you know, that layer before it gets down to the gravel where our aquifers are for our wells, okay? So that is basically my H antigen. So I've got my H antigen, then I got my, which is, you know, the sub- dirt, okay, and then I've got my hemlock tree growing out of it. So picture that on a round surface like my red blood cell, right? So I got, there's the dirt, right? There's the dirt, and then my pine tree. It's hard to draw with a mouse, okay? So that's like an A antigen on a cell, okay? So say you have um, my neighbor across the street has some beech trees, okay? So we'll say B antigen is likened to the B tree, the beech tree, okay? So they have that growing, so that's like their antigen. And antigens are basically like a glycoprotein, so basically like carbohydrates or, or protein chains that are coming out of the scaffolding within your cell. If you go back to basic cell biology and you know that cell um, membrane has all kinds of um, different proteins in it. Um, you probably got this in hematology, where we looked at like the actin and spectrin um, and the structure um, of that cell membrane. Well, through those, um, you may have seen blood group antigens. You just didn't know that you were looking at them at the time because you hadn't learned them. Um, so we all have a different mosaic. And there's other antigens, you know, Duffy, Kid, um, the Kell system, um, Lutheran system, and then Colton. And I mean, we can, Diego, we can go through all these obscure um, antigens that we don't see very often. But we have to do a screen to make sure that we're identifying these other um, potential antibodies to these other blood uh, other blood group antigens. Um, so each chapter will discuss um, the different um, systems um, and different blood groups. So as we move forward, you'll understand what I'm saying a little better. Um, but we really need to make sure that we know um, the clinical significance in the class of these. So it, we don't want to miss um, if we're doing a screen, we don't want to miss doing that immediate spin or 37 degree phase because we could miss um, picking up either an IgM or IgG class. Um, typically speaking, the IgGs uh, uh, antibodies are more clinically significant and the IgM less so. Um, but again, we'll talk more about that as well. I know that was a long tangent to just talk for a, an ab objective item. Um, but, you know, this is where I get to tell you things and help you understand it. Um, be sure, too, that if there is something here that you think is cool or you want to talk more about or you have questions on, um, that you post that um, within the questions of the week. Everybody has to post once. They're on their own. And everybody has to comment on two peers. Um, so we need to have a discussion. We need to start talking about this because we can't do it in person. Um, and then we're going to talk about universal donor, universal recipient. You may already know this. Who knows? Um, we'll look at technical errors that can result in um, ABO discrepancies. Um, we can talk about acquired B, which is very interesting, um, and then ABO discrepancies that would come from these different phenotypes, and how do we resolve discrepancies, um, how do we get weak expressed ABO antigens, um, how do we fix these um, discrepancies, discuss a Bombay phenotype, and then define secretor and non-secretor. So, here we go. So when we look at the history of the blood group system, um, Carl Landsteiner was the one that discovered this uh, in 1900. Um, and it's really cool because, you know, some of, I'm really fascinated by medical history. I'm one of those weirdos that watches those kind of shows, um, but, and, and reads those type of articles. Um, but the first transfusion um, to a human was basically a, I believe it was a goat, um, to a postpartum woman who was hemorrhaging. Um, way back when, you know, the most common cause of death for a female was, um, you know, a hemorrhage after a childbirth or death in childbirth. Um, so at this time, you know, cows and goats um, were considered holy animals. Um, and this was around the time where they said good humor, bad humor. Um, goes back to immunology with, you know, we call it the humoral um, system or the humoral immune response. And that's basically, um, originating from when we said good humors, bad humors were basically good blood, bad blood, um, 
and this comes out of bloodletting, trying to take out the bad humors and leave only the good. When in actuality, we just kind of like made them sicker and killed them faster, um, like George Washington um, exsanguinating to death, which is great. Um, we basically bloodled them to death, um, but we, you know, we didn't know any better. Um, we used to taste test urine, so we clearly didn't know any better. <laughs> Gross, right? Um, so, you know, this uh, idea of this first transfusion was to basically try and use a holy animal to maybe give this poor woman good humors uh, as they were replacing the blood. Clearly it was an epic fail. Their blood is not compatible with ours. And we didn't know the blood types yet. So who knows? Um, so that woman died. Uh, but uh, Carl Landsteiner came around um, and basically um, created this blood group system or named it. It already existed. Um, but the Landsteiner's rule, when they call it a law, basically says that um, healthy people have ABO antibodies to the ABO blood group antigens that are not on their red blood cells. So I am A negative. So I am A type A RH negative, which means I have naturally occurring anti B or antibody against the B antigen. If I were type B, I would have what? I would have the naturally occurring antibody to anti A. Um, if I were type AB, I don't have any because I have both antigens, so I don't have anti A and I don't have anti B. Um, if I were type O, I would have both anti A and anti B because I didn't have either of the antigens. Um, remember this, because when we talk about compatibility, this is um, going to come into play later on. So um, here you go here, where we have um, our blood groups. I just told you this. I Again, I tend to just talk ahead of the PowerPoint. Um, but here's your A. B patient where you have the B antigen and the A antigen, so there are no antibodies. And here, just like me, is the A antigen on the cells, so we have anti-B. Um, you notice this big, big group here? One, two, three, four, five. Anybody want to hazard a guess? I know you can't answer it, um, but I also teach the Socratic way, so it's very hard for me to ask the question and not get your answers. But these here are IgM, okay? The nice big tetramers, all right? Um, and then here's your group B, and they have anti-A, and then your O has none. Um, so, well, it has none of the A or B. It has, we can't see them, but it has H antigens. So I always say, like, um, where we talked about this being a pine tree, this being a beech tree, this is the grass. <laughs> <laughs> it's got grass and dirt. Um, so what are our general characteristics? So ABO antigens are intrinsic to the red cell membrane or they're soluble and can be found in body fluids. Um, they're detected in the embryo as early as five to six weeks gestation. Um, Cause remember that yolk sac, uh, that's where the hematopoiesis begins. So as soon as we start manufacturing our blood cells, we'll start seeing um, the ABO antigens. Um, red cells have fewer numbers of antigens um, and sometimes don't have them fully developed yet. Um, and they'll fully express those antigens when they're two to four years old. Um, newborns also do not have um, any of the antibodies that we normally would see. They develop those um, on their own. Um, they start Their immune system starts manufacturing immunoglobulins, most likely around age um, six months and above. Um, some kids can lag behind or come a little earlier, um, but basically we're um, exposed to something that looks like the antigens, um, and we develop those um, upon exposure once we get a little older in our immune system. System is bumped up. Um, so you can see the frequency distributions of our phenotypes um, in um, the U.S. population, um, and they um, typically in blood bank, um, they're not going to expand um, uh, anything beyond white, black, and Asian. They're very simplistic. Um, we do, um, because, you know, in the United States, we have such a combination um, of of races now um that we start seeing um 
skewed statistics because we're not just falling into this, I'm just black. Well, you know, maybe I'm half black and half Asian. Um, so we're starting to see a lot of um, changes in these statistics, but these are our basic statistics um, where typically, as you can see, um, most of the population is O, um, almost half. Um, then um, for Caucasians, we're looking at 40% A, um, and then that's a little lower um, as we move forward um, into um, if you are black or Asian. Um, so it's very interesting to see the distribution, but as you can see, AB is one of our most uncommon um, blood types. Um, as we Once we get into the RH um, lecture, which is next week, um, you will try ABORH this Friday, um, but you won't um, get the lecture um, for the RH phenotype till next week, but that's okay because you'll have done it um, and then you'll actually have like kind of a mental picture um, when you get to that point as well. Um, I also have a nice picture um, that I drew. I'll have to find it. Um, that kind of helps with the uh, blood group as well, um, testing. So I'll, I'll get that out to you. Um, and who knows, maybe uh, um, uh, Professor P can, uh, Skype me in and we can uh, chat again or I can demo it, who knows. Um, all right, so um, when we look at our genetics um, for the ABO and H antigen, um, they have three separate loci um, that will influence the um, occurrence of the ABO antigens. So you have your ABO, your H, and your secretor. Um, so basically the presence of all of these on the membrane is controlled by that H gene. Remember I told you that uh, pedestal is present. Well, it's controlled by the H gene itself. And the presence or absence of um, these antigens um, within the secretions is controlled by our secretor gene. Um, so that's how they're all connected. Um, so our H gene, um, we will have the H and little h. Little h is an amorph. Um, and the Bombay phenotype um, that you heard about, it was. Uh, we'll talk more um, as well, um, but this was developed in um, Bombay um, or discovered in Bombay. And basically they, this patient um, lacks the H antigen um, and can be a real weird um, uh, thing to see in the laboratory. We had um, one when I was up at Brockton Hospital that was a pseudo Bombay. Um, and basically he ended up being um, like a, a, an RH mosaic um, that we couldn't detect with our reagents. It was very odd, um, but they called it a pseudo Bombay phenotype because we couldn't find any compatible blood. And it basically looked like he had no H antigen, so he had nothing. Um, so he was typing as own egg basically, because there was nothing there, um, but we couldn't get um, back types to match. We couldn't get um, compatible units. So we had to treat them as a Bombay, and um, we ordered blood from Washington State, um, glycerolized uh, red cells that were frozen um, in a donut. And we'll, we'll talk more about that process when we talk about blood products, but it was a real pain in the butt case, but real fascinating at the same time. Um, and then your secretor um, gene will uh, produce the SE, um, so the big SE and little SE alleles, and again, another amorph. Um, and then your ABO genes, your AB and your O alleles. Um, so the basic structure um, is an oligosaccharide chain. Um, so that's a precursor for a lot of our red cell antigens, including our A, B, and H. Um, it's attached to a protein or lipid um, carrier molecule. Um, so this will actually show you um, what it looks like in the body fluids and what it looks like um, in, um, with our red blood cells as well. It's pretty fascinating. So then our H um, gene is basically coding for what's called the glucosal transferase. And this will actually take the immunodominant sugar, L-fucose, to the terminal sugar of that oligosaccharide chain. Um, and basically, as you can see, it helps provide the foundation for each of these products. All right, so we need the H foundation um, for the A and B antigens. Now, um, going back here, I'm not going to test you. I'm not going to give you this and make you write it out. Um, you need to know it. You need to know that H 
you need the H antigen to have the A or B antigen. Um, and then the O's have only the H antigen. Um, that's pretty much the extent of, of what you're going to need for the certification exam. Um, the book gets into it a little further, um, but I always find for me, I like this type of visual. Um, so I kind of have a mental picture of what it looks like instead of being like just a jumble of words over here. So our A and B antigens. Um, the, the A gene will code for this transferase that adds an immunodominant sugar. So this is your N-acetylgalactosamine um, to the terminal sugar of the H antigen. So then the gene product is your N-acetylgalactosaminal transferase. Say that 10 times fast in a row. And then your B gene uh, codes for transferase that adds an immunodominant sugar, D-galactose, to the terminal sugar of the H antigen. Okay, so you're getting the point here where our H antigen is our base. And then the gene product for the B is our D galactosal transferase. And everybody knows what A's means, right? That's an enzyme. Okay, so certain um, blood types have more H antigens than others do. Um, so group O's have more antigen sites because they don't have A or B antigens. So picture your backyard. If you've got a dense forest um, and it's all really dark pine trees that don't let any light through even in the winter months, um, you don't have a lot of room for anything else to grow. Not even talking about like acidity of soil or anything like that. Um, but the more dense your garden is, the less room you have for other things to grow. So if you have um, fewer trees and plenty of grass space, um, you can get a lot of weeds, you can get a lot of different things growing. So that's why group O have more antigen sites because there's just more space. So there's no H, um, there's no um, A or B getting in the way, it can grow as like as it pleases. Um, just like type AB has the fewest H antigens um, by itself because there's no um, room for anything else. So we do have subgroups um, of the blood type A. Um, so our two main subgroups are A and A1 um, and then A2. Uh, well, so A1 and A2, excuse me. Um, they both react with anti-A. Um, so if we need to distinguish the two of them, we use what's called the dicolus bifloris, um, which is a lectin um, from this bacteria, um, and it'll agglutinate with A1. It doesn't agglutinate with A2. Um, so 80% um, of most of the patients that are uh, have the A antigen, um, so if they're group A or group AB, um, they're type A1, and 20% are A2 or A2B. So um, it, this here, this picture actually tells shows you um, the A1 phenotype versus the A2 phenotype. So you can see they have that common center arrow right here. All right, so that reagent that we're using, our typical reagent, picks that up, all right? Um, and this just doesn't get in the way. So it's able to recognize both. Um, so they have similar identifications. Um, so one of the things that um, we will do is if we start seeing some sort of um, discrepancy, we may test with A2 cells um, to get rid of any cross reactivity. We do have some other subgroups. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. Whoops, I just crossed out instead of underlining it. Um, so these are very rare, but we can see um, this coming up if, say, we're not agglutinating with our commercial antisera, um, if we have anti-A1 uh, antibody or anti-H um, that causes a strong agglutination, that would indicate that maybe there's something else there. Subgroups of B are pretty uncommon um, and typically um, what will happen is they just don't react strongly with anti-B reagents. Um, and I actually typically see um, when I'm doing tube typing at work, um, so I have two different jobs in hospitals. So in one job um, that I've been working at, so this is the blood bank I used to manage, um, we use solid face capture. Um, so the machine itself will do the blood type um, in small micro wells. Um, and it, and then when I work at my other hospital, um, we do two blood types and we use gel 
um, methodology for the screens. Um, so when I'm working um, with the tube types, uh, typically speaking, I'll be getting three to four plus reactions for the most part in both in um, in the with A cells and with B cells. Um, but we do occasionally see weaker um, back types um, of B. Um, so and then sometimes we'll see weaker reactivity. Um, so that that's something that we can see as well. Um, so why is it important to identify subgroups? Well, we could actually potentially transfuse a patient um, the wrong um, blood group. Um, and we kind of don't want to do that uh, because, you know, that's bad. Uh, but if, <laughs> just kidding, um, it is actually bad. But the reason being is that, you know, we need to give um, correct blood types um, to prevent any transfusion reactions. So for this example here, they say a patient is an, a group A subgroup um, or the donor is, um, but they classify it as a group O. So then, you know, patient X is a group O and is waiting for transfusion and gets transfused this A subgroup. Well, guess what? the person has anti-A and we can cause um, a transfusion reaction with the patient's anti-A attacking the donor cells that actually do have the A um, antigen on them. So that's why we have to be careful about that. Um, so when we talk about ABO antibodies, these are non-red cell stimulated. So we consider them naturally occurring and naturally occurring air quotes. Okay, um, so basically this antibody production itself is unrelated to a red cell antigen. So typically speaking, we're exposed to something um, that looks like the A and B antigens, whether it's normal bacterial flora, viruses, something. We don't actually know what, it's just we develop them. Um, so typically we're seeing three to six months where they develop it, um, but mostly um, uh, most blood banks we won't test um, anyone under six months of age. Um, titers will get to their highest levels around five to 10 years of age, and then will decrease um, as an individual grows older. So when I told you about the tube typing and the type B, when we run it with the B cells, um, actually just, I, I worked um, Friday, um, and I had a patient, I had to incubate at room temperature because the back type or testing the patient's plasma um, where we'd be looking for the antibodies. Um, I had front typed the patient with um, anti-A, anti-B, and anti-D, and the patient was typing as type A, which means I would expect no reactivity with A cells, but I would expect reactivity with B cells because we have naturally occurring anti-B. And I did not get that with this patient, um, so I had to incubate it um, at room temp uh, 10 minutes. Uh, to give it a little more time to react, and I, I got a one-plus reaction. So that's a pretty weak agglutination um, for um, a blood group. So um, when we look at our ABO antibodies, so our antibody class um, is typically IgM for our A and B antigens, um, and a lot of the times we'll see IgG um, for our um, O patients. And we have an anti-A, um, comma, B as well. Um, so most of these um, anti-A and anti-B antibodies um, typically um, are clinically significant because they can bind complement, um, which would cause um, some reactivity uh, in uh, transfusions if we got transfused off type and would cause transfusion reactions and patient organ shutdown and death. Um, so we will read um, at immediate spin um, uh, for cross-matching. And basically, um, this is, we add patient plasma um, with cells and spin it down and read for agglutination. Um, remember when we talked about um, some of the ways, um, well, ooh, I'm not sure if we did, um, it would have been a review. We would have talked about it in immunology. I'm not sure um, what you got in immunology, but we have different ways um, that we can enhance agglutination. Um, so we can incubate. Uh, we can add potentiating agents, which I know we did talk about, like LIS and PEG, um, albumin. Um, and then we can use a mechanical means to get the cell closer, um, and that would be our centrifugation. 
And then our anti A comma B antibody is found in our group O people, um, and it cross reacts with both A and B antigens. So our anti A1 antibody, this is produced by our subgroups of A type. It has a specificity to the A1 antigen, but doesn't agglutinate A2 cells. We don't consider this clinically significant, but we can occasionally see this um, in immediate spin testing um, because it's causing incompatible cross matches because what did I tell you were our most common um, blood types? Most of us are A1. So if, if this patient has an anti-A1 um, and most of us are donating our A1, um, they're going to react to it. So when we look at our routine um, ABO phenotyping, because remember phenotyping is what we see, genotyping is what we genetically inherit. Um, so I'm actually, so it's funny, I'm in a family of a bunch of A neg people. My dad's A neg, I'm A neg, my two kids are A neg, my sister's A neg, her two kids are A neg, um, but my mom is O. So I have, um, if you remember the typical, um, you know, the Punnett square where you do it this way, you know, we inherit copies. So I could be two different things. Like, so if my dad's AO and my mom's, oops, OO, I could have AO, OO. So fifth, ugh, I can't do it because it's, it's erasing me as we go. Um, but I could potentially have been a type O. Um, so I could be AA or I could be AO um, because the AB are considered co-dominant alleys, the ABO are co-dominant, um, but if you have the A or B antigen, it will be expressed and we will see that. Um, so um, I type as A, um, but one of my um, alleles could be O. Um, so when we look at our phenotyping um, or what we see, we have what's called forward um, and reverse or forward and back typing. Um, and basically they are reverse of each other um, and they confirm each other. So our forward typing is um, our patient red cells. So these are patient red cells, okay? Patient red cells and reagent anti-sera, okay? All right. All right, so that's reagent antibody. So we have anti-A, anti-B, and then anti-D. I always mush the, this isn't considered the RH antigen, um, but I always consider the D um, as part of it. Um, so this will determine our ABO phenotype, so anti-A and anti-B. And then our reverse grouping, it's patient plasma, okay? Patient plasma and reagent red blood cells, all right? So reagent red blood cells, okay? So these are known um, and they'll be A cells and B cells um, and they are known um, antigens. So what we're doing is here, we're looking to see what antigens are on the patient's red blood cells. And here, we're looking at what antibodies they have to blood groups. So they have to confirm to each other. So what'll happen is, if I am reacting here in tube A, so this would be my cells are reacting with anti-A, then would I expect reactivity in the A cell tube? No, because in the front type, it's saying that I have reactivity of, against A cells, okay? So I have anti-A, which means I have A cells. So back here, I'm going to expect to see reactivity in which tube? In the B cell tube, because I will make, if I'm a patient that's type A, I will make antibodies against the B antibody. I mean the B um, antigen, excuse me. Um, so we're always expecting the opposite in our back type. So if I'm type O, I am not gonna react with anything in this forward type. I don't have A antigen, I don't have B antigen, but I have antibody to both. So I will react to both the A cells and the B cells. And we have to do um, forward and reverse typing, it's required. Um, so this will actually show you here where our group A, it's reacting here, not here. 
won't react with the cells, but will react with the B cells. And then group B, not reacting with anti-A, because remember, anti is against. This means against A, against B. Um, so if it's group B, it's got identifying the B antigen, and then it's going to react with the A cells, but not the B cells, because we don't react with self. And then here's your O, where it's not reacting at all in the forward type, but reacting in the back type. And then as you can imagine, group A is reacting with the um, anti-A and anti-B, but not with the A and B cells, because it has both. So when we look at selection for transfusion, um, we need to make sure that we are looking um, for, of course, first, what are we don't, what are we selecting? Are we selecting red blood cells? Uh, pack cells or leukoreduced cells is what they're called, um, or are we looking for plasma? So we, in both situations, we always want to do ABO identi um, identical if we can't, um, but we want to make sure um, that we do ABO compatible units um, for red cells um, should we need to go off type. For a plasma transfusion, it's the reverse of the red cell transfusions, because remember, if I am type A, I can't get plasma that has anti-A floating in it, okay? So what ends up happening is um, if we get incompatible red cells, we can have a hemolytic transfusion reaction um, and that can kill us. And then at the same time, if we get a plasma that has anti-A and we're type A, that anti-A that's circulating will actually react with our own cells. And again, we can get a mild um, transfusion reaction. Um, and we could actually potentially die from that as well, depending on how much plasma we get. Um, if we are potentially doing whole blood transfusions, which is incredibly rare, um, we have to do ABO identical. So our, our red cells, our group O, is considered our universal donor. It can give to everyone. Um, group AB is the universal recipient because it can receive everything. Um, in plasma, group AB is our universal donor because there are no um, antibodies present in that plasma. And group O is the universal recipient because they have anti-A and anti-B and no antigens, so it's not going to matter. So here are our ABO compatibility charts. You basically want to memorize this um, because people have a hard time with this. Um, so if you're A, you can get A or O cells, and you can get A or AB plasma. Um, if you're group B, you can get B or O um, red blood cells, and you can get groups B or AB plasma. If you're AB, you can get A, B, A, B, or O red blood cells, but you can only get A, B plasma. And if you're group O, you can only get O cells, um, but you can get O, A, B, or A, B plasma. So here comes the fun part where we look at ABO discrepancies. So these occur when something happens and our forward doesn't match our reverse. So we can see this um, if the agglutination is weaker than we would expect it to be. If an expected reaction is missing, or we have some sort of extra reaction that's coming. Um, so what can we potentially see causing it? Well, they, they kind of blop it into three different categories. So um, identification or documentation errors, reagent or equipment errors, and standard operating procedure errors. So first, um, maybe we want to look at, um, did we have the right sample? Is everything labeled right? Did we record everything appropriately? Did we interpret everything appropriately? Then are there reagent or equipment error? Did we do QC and is it okay? Um, did we do that on all the reagents? Um, are reagents contaminated or hemolyzed? Um, is the centrifuge working appropriately and is it has it been calibrated in the time working? Um, and then we look at standard operating errors. Did we follow the manufacturer's instructions? Did we use the right specimen uh, at, um, reagents? Did we use the right cell suspension? So if you remember, if you go back to immunology, um, all of the um, agglutination reactions need to occur at that zone of equivalence. Um, and we don't want a post-zone or pro-zone um, error. We want it right in that zone of equivalence. Okay, right in here, um, 
because we don't want antigen excess or we don't want antibody excess. Um, or did we completely resuspend um, the cell button? A lot of the times people will call, call it a four plus reaction um, when in actuality they didn't shake the tube enough to get the cell button off the bottom. Um, so always make sure you fully resuspend. Um, so when we look at what can we see that are sample related discrepancies, so we can see um, they broke this down um, nicely. This is a helpful chart. Um, I do really like the charts in this book. It really helps um, kind of make sense of the information. Um, but we can look at problems with the red cell testing. Um, so we can see extra antigens where we have a group A that has an acquired B antigen. Um, we can see a BA phenotype, polyagglutination, um, rouleau, or stacking of the red cells like um, coins because of high protein levels. Um, we can see it in stem cell transplants. Um, we can see missing or weak antigens where we have an ABO subgroup or it's pathologic. This patient has a transplant. Um, we can see mixed field reactions um, where maybe it was a massive transfusion and they got a ton of group O. Um, and now they're typing as A and O. Um, we can see again in stem cell transplants or if they have that weird A3 phenotype. When we look at problems with the serum or plasma testing, um, this patient could have extra antibodies because of subgroups with anti-A1. Cold alloantibodies or cold autoantibodies, Rouleau can cause problems here. Um, if they get IVIG, so what ends up happening is as patients that um, are undergoing chemotherapy um, or have had um, bone marrow transplants or have some sort of um, leukemia or lymphoma, um, they don't often have their immune system uh, where it needs to be. So a lot of the times they'll get infusions of IgG. So that's what that is. Um, so then that will cause some weird reactions as well. Um, where do you see that after they come in for a type and screen after they've had their IVIG and see your screen? Um, we can see missing or weak antibodies, newborn, because um, they haven't developed it yet, elderly, because as we old, so does our immune system, we make less antibodies. Um, we can see um, uh, pathologics um, causing this, um, or they're on immunosuppressive therapy for transplantation as well. Um, don't mind the scratches. My I shut my door and the dogs are trying to get to me because they want mommy. Um, anyway, um, so when we get into some of these um, that I just quickly summarized, but um, acquired B um, is basically um, group A immunodominant sugar that's altered by um, bacterial uh, deacetylene enzyme. Um, so it looks like group B, but it cross reacts with anti B. Um, so it's not really group B. Your BA phenotype um, is similar to the acquired B, but the patient is group B, um, but gets like a weird A coming along with it. Um, polyagglutination is basically where we have a hidden um, antigen on the red cell that's exposed and reacts with most human sera. Um, Non-specific uh, uh, aggregation, um, Rouleau, which is that an abnormal amount of serum or protein. What I didn't mention before is Wharton's jelly. Um, this is actually within um, the cord blood. So if we're testing cord bloods, um, they're taking it directly from the cord after delivery. Um, so this tissue, it's basically gelatinous and kind of goopy. Um, if we don't wash the red cells enough, um, it can cause reactivity across the board. Um, and it's not true agglutination. It's just so sticky that it makes them all stick together. Um, again, ABO subgroups can have weak or no reactivity with the anti-A, anti-B reagents. Um, and then patients with leukemia or Hodgkin's um, can actually have weakened antigen expression as well. Um, so we need to make sure that if we do get a subgroup, we've got to go through the patient history. We have to see, are they, have they had a transplant? Have they had um, a stem cell transplant? Have they had a solid organ transplant? Have they had multiple transfusions? Um, you know, do, do they have certain medications, things like that? So we have to pay attention to all of that. And then we'll also repeat with anti-A comma B um, just to enhance it if it is a subgroup. Um, mixed field reactions, a lot of times we can't fix that. We can't resolve it. Um, so we will actually um, temporarily just call them group O and only give the safe blood. Um, 
so these can come from marrow transplants or stem cell transplant recipients um, if the patient is A3 um, phenotype um, or they have polyagglutinable red cells, which is a little weird and pretty uncommon. Um, so a lot of the times when in doubt, we're going to give them type O just to be on the safe side. Um, and then if we had to transfuse them with plasma, we would give them the universal donor, which is your A comma B. Um, extra antibodies themselves. Um, they can have your anti-A1 or your cold aloe um, antibodies, and these are basically, um, they're specific for human red cells that react at room temperature or, or below, um, so we can pick these up in the tube testing. These are not as common as a warm auto, uh, where we're going to pick them up later on in incubation in a screen. Um, and then your cold autoantibodies are basically antibodies that react at room temperature below, but they're our self-antigens, so we're reacting against ourselves. And then Rouleau or those stack of coins from protein causes fake agglutination. Um, so how do we resolve Rouleau? Um, basically what you're going to do is if you suspect it, it always looks funky. It doesn't, if you're using an agglutination viewer with a mirror, it doesn't look right. It doesn't look like true agglutination. If you question that, go ahead and take a peek, dump it out onto a slide, and then um, slide it back in. Um, I can probably make a video and show you that. Um, um, but basically, you put a drop, tap a drop out on the edge of a glass slide, and then tilt the slide to get the rest of the drop back into the tube, um, and look at it under the microscope under a 10 objective. You can usually see the coins lining up. So if it's that case, what you're going to do is you're going to basically spin down um, the tube, um, take out um, the plasma um, with a pipette um, and then add in, um, so basically typically we're testing like two drops of plasma, you're going to add in two drops of saline, mix it and centrifuge and re-suspend uh, again um, and then you will most likely see the rouleau go away. Um, but if it doesn't go away then that is true agglutination and you have to record it. Um, we can see missing or weak antibodies, so we see weak or negative agglutination in the back type or reverse phase. So we can see typically, um, again, elderly because their immune systems are not um, working as well, newborn because we haven't done it yet, um, or um, other diseases that show uh, low immunoglobulin levels. Um, so here's a couple um, examples of discrepancies. So this is what your acquired B looks like. So we have 4 plus anti-A, but a 1 plus anti-B. But then look, this back type matches this. So this here is extra, and that's our acquired B. Um, so if we test with autologous red cells, it'll be negative. Um, and then your BA phenotype, where see you've got this extra one plus and you got a four plus, four plus. So this is the extraneous reaction. So we would test um, with other monoclonal antisera um, or anti-A from a different manufacturer. Subgroup of A will look like this because we're, we're missing something here. We're not picking something up. So we either incubate it or repeat with anti-A comma B. And then a group patient um, transfused, a group B transfused with O um, would look like this, um, our mixed field, because if we're getting transfused with O, we've got the typical two plus reactivity, but then we've got the zero reactivity um, because of um, that blood group. And remember, we don't have any change in this back because remember, we're only transfusing red cells. This is just plasma. So we'll check the transfusion history. This we typically will only see after um, large amounts of off-type or massive transfusions. Um, some other discrepancy examples. I'm not going to go through everything because um, you can read through as well. But as you can see, this is very suspicious um, agglutination across the board. Here, um, we've got something weird here. Um, where this is not looking like a normal reactivity. Um, this looks like um, something here is extra. All right, so we're going to do an auto control, um, and that's basically running the patient's um, plasma with their own cell suspension to look for any reactivity. So here's our Bombay phenotype. This is the fun. Um, so it was discovered again in Bombay, India, and it has lacks the H antigen. So it has those two, it's got an HH, little h, little h, which is an amorph. So there's little or no production of that L-fucosal transferase. So basically, 
will label the patient as O because there's no H, there's no A, there's no B, and the patient serum contains anti-H, anti-A, and anti-B. So this is where we were finding our patient to, you know, type as O, but when we tried to cross-match O, that patient had anti-H as well as anti-A and anti-B. So we're trying to give them group O um, because, you know, that's what it looked like. But the anti-H was reacting to the H antigen on the O donor cells. So this is where we had to go into the rare donor file. I'm not sure if that patient ended up passing away. He was with us for a while. Um, and then when we look at secretor status, um, so this is, remember, your big S and little s, E. Um, so your your SE is responsible for our H substance um, within our body secretions, um, and we'll um, convert it to A or B by our glucosal transferase. Um, so 80% of uh, all of us are secretors. Um, so remember homozygous versus heterozygous, where homozygous has that double dose of that same one, and heterozygous is a mix. Um, and then 20% um, are non-secretors, or we have the little s, little se, little se. So for an example here, here's our genes, all right? These are our genes that are we're inherit inheriting in example one, all right? So we have our AB, our HH, and our secretor, secretor, and then little secretor, little secretor. And what are we going to express on our cells? Well, on our red cells, we're going to have A, B, and H. Um, in the, this patient, we're going to have A, B, and H in the saliva because we have the secretor gene. But here, this falls under the 20% of a non-secretor, so we won't have any um, on our, in our saliva. Um, and then the same example here, where we inherit OO and HH, big secretor, little secretor. Um, this is considered dominant. Okay, so it's going to overrule this. So this patient will be a secretor, um, but we'll only show the H antigen and the H antigen in the saliva. And then in this case, where we didn't inherit the secretor, um, we will only have the H antigen on the red cells. And that is ABO um, in a nutshell. Um, and so one of the things that you really want to um, pay attention to is the chart of reactivity, what your expected reactions are going to be. And honestly, if you haven't done a blood type before in your hands, like really getting um, you know, dirty in there and doing it yourself, it's not gonna make as much sense. Um, I did post up some videos um, for you um, that are links to YouTube, and there is um, uh, how to do a type and screen. Um, so I'm going to recommend you go ahead and do that. Uh, watch that before Friday. Um, so you got a little better idea um, of what you're going to do. Um, again, the one that I showed you has the D, anti-D um, in there as well to look for the RH. Um, so I'm not sure if Professor P is going to have you do that or not. doesn't really matter. Um, but just know that when you do start looking at it, you're looking for the presence of the RH antigen or the absence of it. Presence of the RH antigen means the patient is RH positive. Absence of the RH antigen means the patient is RH negative. Um, so go ahead and check out those. And I look forward to seeing your questions of the week.